It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker uh, today, uh, a colleague and friend. I uh, run into Guy uh, uh, many days uh, during the week at, uh, at McMaster Hamilton. Um, Dr. Pere is an associate professor at the Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine at McMaster University and director of the Genetic and Molecular Epidemiology Laboratory. Dr. Pere is a heart and stroke funded researcher currently holds a Canada Research Chair in Genetics and Molecular Epidemiology, as well as a Cisco Professorship. His clinical interests are centered on lipoprotein disorders, obesity, cardiovascular disease prevention. He practices as a physician. His, cor his corresponding research interests are in cardiovascular genetics, biomarker development, and pharmacogenetics, and these interests have led to expertise in bioinformatics, high-throughput biology, and genetic epidemiology. And today he's talking about personalized medicine or something along that line, which I'm very interested in hearing about. Dr. Paré. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Wes, for the nice introduction. And most of all, uh, thank you for the invitation and the pleasure to be uh, with you guys uh, today. So, um, so these are my disclosures. And what I will do um, this morning is discuss pharmacogenetics, you know, for stroke and, you know, where we are going uh, with this. And, uh, but first, Yes, but first I would like to start with a small quiz. And you know, we've got a lot of clinicians in the room and I would just like you to take a few moments and think about you know, what might be wrong with uh, this fellow here. And uh, you can think of a few answers, uh, but I might just give you a further clue by showing you the next picture. And here we go. So I hope that the uh, answer is becoming clearer uh, and you can make a few hypotheses on what this could be. Uh, but I think that the third one will really give it away. And essentially, you know, this is the magic of Photoshop. And essentially, <laughs> so these are actually two individuals and they were put together, you know, through Photoshop. And this leads me to, um, a statement that say genetics are awesome. No one would say like that's only my opinion because that's what I do. This is actually the title of a, a photography exhibit by an artist from Quebec, and uh, essentially these are uh, you know relatives. Uh, you can see like a pair of brothers, father, son, and in the third case, obviously non-identical twins that have been put together, and this whole exhibit has gotten a lot of traction, and. The point I want to make with all of this is that, you know, we have to remember why do we care about genetics? And the reason we care, we just have to open the family album and we see our traits, you know, they run in families and how similar we look like. And essentially the question becomes, well, oops, well, you know, uh, why could this be? And obviously this is, you know, because of our DNA and just, I won't go through this, but you know, the DNA is, is our code is written in an alphabet with four letters. These are the four nucleotides and uh, organized in the pairs of chromosome. And <clears throat> the great thing here is that, you know, surprisingly or not, we're 99.9% .9 identical. Um, you know, it might not be obvious when, you know, we've got the pesky neighbor or something, but that's the reality. And really the challenge is to find, you know, what are these variants? Um, that would make a difference and that explains, you know, why these traits run in family. Okay. And so just to put things in perspective, okay, so when we talk about genetics, we are talking about irritability. And I think, you know, it's obvious to everyone that facial appearance has a strong genetic component. So what is the irritability of the way we look? So there are ways to do this, and you know the ways to do this is the same way that the Google and Facebook of this world will identify faces, you know, throughout the web, and they've got these landmarks, these features, and then they will calculate, you know, the, the distance between the tip of the nose and one eye, etc. And with these measures, we can actually estimate how much of the variation and the way we look is due to genetics. 
And essentially the answer when it, it comes to uh, or, or uh, facial appearance is about 67% is due to genetics. So let's keep this number in mind and you know, go back to you know, something that is a little bit more relevant. And essentially, if the way we look is you know, so irritable, well, you know, what about disease? And in the case that is of interest to me, what about you know, cardiovascular disease and atherosclerotic disease, uh, et cetera? And, um, well, I apologize for the, uh, the slide, but uh, essentially, you know, the, the bottom line is that the irritability of, uh, you know, cardiovascular disease is about the same as the irritability of our facial appearance. So if we could look, you know, through people's and see people's coronary, we would say, well, you know, this guy has the same coronaries as his father the same way that, you know, we can say, well, this guy has the same nose as his father. And, um, and this is quite important. And for me, you know, this really, uh, you know, gives the good reason to try to understand the genetics of it. And this is not the case only for cardiovascular disease, but, uh, you know, it just turns out that most human traits are irritable to about the same extent, and it varies, you know, from trait to trait. Uh, some are more irritable than the others, but as a rule of thumb, it's about 50% because of our genes and 50% because of the environment. Okay. So, now let's go back to uh, our clinical question of interest, and what about, you know, stroke genetics? So, you know, knowing that traits are irritable, um, how can we apply this to, you know, uh, uh, clinical practice and what are the, the potential pitfalls. So again, you know, the first question that we ask, well, you know, is, is drug response even irritable? And this is a, a seminal study that was done here in Toronto, actually, in uh, the 1960s. And essentially, they've looked for the metabolism of drugs and identical versus non-identical twins. And what they've seen is that actually the metabolism is strikingly similar in identical twins, and it's quite similar in non-identical twin, but to a lesser extent. And in fact, you know, we now know that when it comes to drug metabolism, genetics is actually very important, and uh, this has been recognized by the FDA, and there's over 200 tests that have been approved by FDA uh, for use in pharmacogenetics. And I would say that most of them are in the field of oncology, but there are some exceptions where the, where the therapeutic index of these drugs is very narrow, and a slight difference in metabolism can make a big difference in clinical outcome. Okay, so now going back to cardiovascular disease, let's take a, uh, a case study that is inspired by you know, a, uh, a true story. Uh, so 68-year-old male with atrial fibrillation and a history of ICH. He is uh, a retired engineer, um, always the guys coming with the good questions, well control hypertension, and he's currently on aspirin and clopidogrel, and happens that uh, his grandson bought him a 23andMe kit and has shown that a CYP2C19, he's carrying a loss of function mutation. So uh, what should we do? A, you know, nothing. B, stop clopidogrel without replacement. C, increase the dose of clopidogrel. Or D, change clopidogrel for ticagrelor. So um, please, if you have your clicker and... What does the kit say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the kid says, you know, they, they mention like the potential of an interaction with clopidogrel. Uh, but, you know, they wouldn't venture into uh, giving recommendation, yeah. Okay, excellent. So uh, let's keep this in mind, and, and then let's go and look at what the evidence would tell us. Oh, oops. Okay, so you know, the whole story you know, came because of FDA box warning uh, 
uh, of reduced effectiveness of clopidogrel in patients who are poor metabolizers, suggesting either higher dose of clopidogrel or use of an alternative antiplatelet agent. And the assumption here is that CYP2C19 poor metabolizers do not convert the prodrug into the active metabolite and therefore do not derive the full clinical benefit from uh, clopidogrel. Now, uh, you know, to address this specific, you know, question, um, we have studied uh, samples from the active A trial, which were high-risk atrial fibrillation patients ineligible to warfarin, and uh, these patients were on the either clopidogrel, placebo, and a background of aspirin with a medium follow-up of 3.6 years, primary efficacy outcomes, stroke MI, non-CNS, embolism, CV death. And in our genetic subsidy, we had 1,100 you know, patients, and importantly, in the subsidy, the benefit of clopidogrel was similar as in the parent study. So, so what we've decided to do in the study is to treat uh, you know, carriage of the loss of function LL as any other subgroup. So in all the clinical trials, you know, well, there's a subgroup like smokers, non-smokers, people with diabetes or without diabetes who so say, well, let's do the same thing maintaining the randomization and looking at the effect of carrying this LL or not. And, you know, so these are the, the results. And essentially what it shows is that there was no difference in efficacy whether individuals were carrying uh, the, uh, the loss of function LL or not. And, you know, this clearly was a, a surprise because it, it went against the... Uh, the prevailing, uh, you know, um, knowledge at this point, uh, but certainly, you know, reassuring. And as you can see, like, uh, the effect is very consistent and the heterogeneity, you know, p-value, non-significant. So, and, and since then, actually, this has been, you know, uh, replicated in a much larger way through a big meta-analysis uh, by a friend of mine, Michael Holmes, and, uh, you know, showing that when you look at the randomization group and CYP2C19 alleles, um, there doesn't seem to be a big impact of the, um, of the genotypes on, uh, you know, the efficacy of clopidogrel. And, and essentially, I think, you know, this clearly was, you know, quite reassuring for, you know, individuals on chronic clopidogrel therapy. And I think, you know, we have learned a lesson here. And, and one of the lessons is that, um, you know, acute ACS, and this is where a lot of the, uh, the discussion about clopidogrel pharmacogenetics has been done, is not the same as chronic clopidogrel therapy. And there's probably a higher need for uh, anticoagulation and the ACS patients, once the patient stabilize, it seems probable that, you know, variation in metabolism of clopidogrel will make less of a difference. And the other thing to remember as well is that in this era of evidence-based medicine, um, you know, it's, it's not only sufficient to show that having a certain polymorphism will have an impact on events, we also have to show that using this information will lead us into better medical decisions. So this is illustrated. If you look at the upper panel, you can see then clearly individuals that carry or not the loss of function variant. There's differences in outcome on clopidogrel uh, and not so much on the alternative therapy. But in this case, the effect would not be sufficient to lead to a better treatment. And to really make a case for pharmacogenetics, we have to be in the lower panel situation where the best treatment is really determined by, uh, you know, by the genotype of an individual. So uh, this might be, you know, maybe a little bit sobering, um, and especially for a geneticist um, in terms of application, but I'm also a clinician, and ultimately we want to do what's right for patients. But then I'll go on with a, uh, a second example, and this is also work that we've done at McMaster, and this is based on the Bigotron and the RELY trial. So as uh, you might remember, the Bigotron detexylate is an oral prodrug, and it's converted by a carboxylesterase to the thrombin inhibitor, the Bigotron. And again, in this case, these are high-risk AF patient uh, with the medium follow-up of 2.2 um, two years.
And essentially, just to remind the, uh, the results of this trial, it showed that uh, the lower dose was as effective as warfarin in preventing ischemic events. The higher dose was superior to warfarin, and both doses have a favorable safety profile. Now, we do know that there's variation in the response to the bigotron, and uh, the inter-individual variation is about is about 30%, and in this case, you know, we have hypothesized that uh, there could be some genetic variants that it could explain part of this variation. So for this study, what we've done is that we've used a two-phase study, and in the first phase, we decided to look what could be the genetic variation that could lead to differences in concentration of the active metabolite. Now, as this was the first study of the bigger trend, uh, you know, we had to find these variations that were not known. So to do this, we've conducted what we'd call a genome-wide association study, and essentially it's screening the whole genome with over 500,000 genetic variants to try to find out which one might be associated. And in the second phase of the study, once we have identified, you know, these variants, we, uh, you know, plan to test them for efficacy and safety outcomes. Okay. So, uh, and, you know, these are the, uh, the results. So, uh, the first thing is that in from our genome-wide screen, so half a million variant, we found four polymorphism that were associated with the concentration of uh, either the, uh, um, the peak or the, the trough concentration. And interestingly, uh, you know, all of them file into genes that are known to be important to the bicutron metabolism. So, uh, you know, three of them were within the carboxyl enzyme, you know, gene cluster, and we know, like, this is the enzyme that metabolizes the prodrug into the active metabolite, and the other is, was near ABCB1, which is a known intestinal transporter of the bigotron. And this by itself is interesting because, you know, the knowledge, at least at the time, was that carboxyl esterase are ubiquitous, and, you know, the biotransformation is almost instantaneous. And the fact there's, there's genetic variation in these genes that affect the concentration of the active metabolite, um, you know, shows that this is actually a rate-limiting step. So then the next step was to, you know, take these variants and uh, to bring them to association with the, uh, with the, uh, with the events. And uh, here what we found uh, is that uh, actually one of the variants had a, a very strong association with, uh, with the risk of bleeding. And I apologize, I think for some reason the, the format of the slides has been, uh, has been modified, obviously. So essentially, uh, you know, the underline should be on the, the third polymorphism. And I said, so what we've seen is that as, uh, is that as um, con you know, consistent with the impact of these polymorphism, on the concentration of the active metabolite. So the, the variant that leads to a lower concentration of the active metabolite is associated with a lesser risk of bleed, and this was consistent with minor bleeds and major bleed. Um, and uh, yes, and then, you know, the next step is uh, to look into the survival analysis. So here you have the uh, four groups, essentially. So in red and black, these are individuals on the bigotron. And in red, these are the carriers of the protective allele. And on, in black, these are the, uh, the non-carriers. And the blue and green lines are individuals that were randomized to warfarin and the carriers on the carriers. So what you can see is that clearly, the, the benefit of the bigotron with respect to the lower risk of bleed is almost exclusively due to individuals on the bigotron that have the protective allele. And here the interaction, you know, was, you know, quite significant. So essentially, you know, there is, there is this hope, uh, you know, that we can use genetic information to try to tailor treatment and optimize, you know, treatment. Okay.
And, uh, and finally, I think, you know, the other area that's very important for stroke pharmacogenetics is warfarin, uh, you know, genetics. And there's certainly been a lot that has been, you know, said and published on this. So uh, warfarin metabolism depends on CYP2C9, and the target of warfarin is uh, VKRC1 that inhibits vitamin K uh, metabolism. And we do know that in both of these genes, uh, there are variation that can account to up to 40% of the virality in response. But that being said, you know, despite this, you know, being, you know, well known and well studied, uh, you know, the whole story remained controversial. And the, con the controversy is not that there's a genetic association of variation in these genes in response to warfarin. This is very well established. The controversy stems is, you know, uh, can using genotypes improve the time and the therapeutic range? And even more so important, can we use genotype to improve outcomes? So I think, you know, the, the best way to, to summarize, you know, the evidence here is to look at uh, three very well published uh, recent trials that have looked at the genetics of warfarin and, you know, the risk of efficacy and safety events. And uh, as you can see, you know, there's some divergence in whether they led to improved time and the therapeutic range. So with the UPAC, uh, did improve, COAG, no, and, and the AGF did improve. And, and none of these trials, there was an association with thrombotic events, but they were probably under power to do so. Uh, but there was an association with bleeding events and the NGAJF. So how can we reconciliate this and this apparently conflicting evidence? And, you know, here the key is actually to look not at the genetic, uh, genetically guided therapy group, but actually to look at the comparator group. So if we look at the UPAC, uh, the investigators have to use a fixed dose of warfarin and, you know, coag a clinical algorithm, and in and KJF, the genetic group was compared to usual care. And essentially what happens here is that the use of any genetic algorithm, you know, uh, has to be compared to, you know, something. And if this something is not very good, then obviously the genetic group will look very, you know, good. And if on the contrary, you know, clinical care without using genetic information is very good, then it's very difficult, uh, you know, to show benefit. And actually this has been recognized in a recent meta-analysis that look at all the trials. And essentially when you look at individuals uh, using a, genetic, a genetically guided algorithm versus a clinical algorithm, uh, there was no difference in time and therapeutic range, INR4, or major bleed. And, and there's a very recent trial that has, you know, just been published, and, and I think this trial is, is very, very well done and, and actually addresses the question in the right way. And in this case, you know, they've used 1,600 patients, age 65 or older, initiated in warfarin for elective hip or knee arthroplasty. And, you know, what I really like about this trial is that they, uh, warfarin management, you know, was strictly based on algorithms, either a genetic algorithm or a clinical algorithm, and then they follow up at, at 30 days. And uh, the, the three figures really summarize the key findings. The figure on the left shows that in the genetic group, there was a slight improvement in time and therapeutic range. And in the uh, second figure, it shows that actually, when people had the genetically guided algorithm, there was a lesser chance to reach, you know, what could be deemed as uh, dangerously high INRs. But at the end of the day, as you can see with the third figure, uh, there was no significant difference in the number of ad adverse outcomes, although there was a trend that would favor the genetically guided algorithm. So I think, you know, the, the conclusion here is that, again, you know, when it comes to evidence-based medicine, we always have to be very cautious of the groups that we're using for comparison. And I think, you know, the message here is that good clinical care
um, you know, doesn't need necessarily to use, you know, very fancy tools. If people are well managed or are foreign, uh, it's probably any good that, you know, um, any cutting edge, you know, genotyping. Okay, so, um, so these are, you know, recent examples of, you know, pharmacogenetics, uh, you know, but where do we take it from there? And, you know, what is the, the future for, uh, you know, stroke genetics in general, and, and especially to tailor treatment, you know, based on genetic uh, information? And, you know, so for this, I'll just, you know, take a few steps back and, 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 and discuss, you know, some of the more general advances in the field of genetics. So, but first, you know, just a quick question. So, uh, what do you think is the irritability of stroke? And so you've got 10%, 25%, 50%, 75%, and 90%. Okay, so, well, that's very good. I see that, you know, like, <laughs> you guys have been listening. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, and it's indeed, you know, about, uh, you know, 50% of, uh, you know, uh, the irritability of stroke is about 50%, meaning that about, you know, 50% of the risk is due to your genes and the other, you know, 50% is due to the environmental factor. Now we have to contrast this with the population attributable risk, and which states that it's 90 percent, uh, and these are seemingly uh, conflictual, but you know all um, they're not really because most risk factors are themselves irritable, and furthermore they you know measure uh, two different things. So irritability is about prediction and PR about prevention. But the fact of the matter remains that if we can understand this 50 percent. This will give us, you know, great tool to better intervene in patients and, you know, perhaps at some point, you know, even tailor therapy. So the challenge here is that, you know, stroke is extremely heterogeneous and there are so many types and all these types have different etiology and, and different mechanism. And, you know, this makes study of the genetics of it very difficult. So there's been, uh, you know, quite a few success when it comes to monogenic forms of stroke, and we believe, you know, these would be quite important for, especially for early stroke. Um, but it still reminds that, you know, these rare disease are only found in a very, very small minority of patients, and, you know, clearly doesn't explain the majority of cases. So what might be happening, uh, you know, if we say that, you know, on the one end, you know, stroke is about, you know, 50% irritable. But on the other end, you know, we can only identify a genetic disease or monogenic form of stroke in a tiny minority. So, uh, you know, for this, we have to go back to the uh, polygenic model. And here you can see, um, you can see uh, uh, Edward Fisher and probably most, one of the most influential, uh, you know, scientific figure of the last century is actually the one that came up with the concept of randomized, uh, you know, trial, has made a lot of a contribution in statistics and was also a very astute geneticist. And despite the fact that, you know, DNA was not even discovered at this time, just from his observation of, you know, height and other traits in family, he came to the conclusion that irritability of traits had to be the results of a very large number of very weak genetic determinants. Okay, and, and you know, amazingly, uh, you know, it took almost 100 years, but he was actually proven right, and this seems to be the basis for the irritability of most human traits. Okay. So again, you know, to uh, put things in perspective, you know, for, you know, a very long time when it came to human genetics, we were focusing on the upper left panel, okay? And the upper left, you know, a panel of this figure, we say rare alleles causing Mendelian disease. And this is cystic fibrosis, 
uh, hemoglobinopathies, etc. And this is also very much the approach that's been used in pharmacogenetics so far. But actually, it appears that the action is really in the lower right panel of the panel. So these are, you know, variation that are quite common in the population, but they yet carry each a small individual risk. Now, the principle here is that if you've got many of them and you combine them together, then you, you, uh, you know, you end up with, you know, something that is actually quite predictive. So in order to identify these, you know, weak variants, there's been this revolution in genetics, uh, which is the genome-wide association study, and essentially being able to, you know, uh, you know, cribble the whole genome with, uh, with assays to detect, you know, genetic variation, and now we can measure up to 10 million or more genetic uh, variants per individual. And in the simplest expression, then we test each of these variants individually to see if they're associated with disease. And, uh, and then once, you know, some of them pass statistical, you know, significance, then we would say that, you know, we have found an association. Okay. So the, the first, actually, GWAS were for uh, macular degeneration, and they found this association with complement factor H. And uh, this was, you know, quickly followed by an explosion in genome-wide association study in the literature. And um, as you know, you can see here, and, and I guess this ends at 2012, but they, there would be even more, you know, now. And actually, this, this whole field led to uh, a corresponding explosion of genetic association. And these are all the genetic associations, you know, formed through GWAS as of 2012. And the reason this is from 2012 is that the authors of this figure decided not to update it beyond 2012 because, you know, there's simply too many. And now we know there's in the tens of thousands of genetic association that have been found through uh, this GWAS methodology. Okay. And, you know, so this leads us to a, a very large effort uh, of which, uh, you know, we were part and looking at... Um, the genetics of stroke in over half a million people uh, of multiple ancestry. And if you, if you look at this, this is actually the state of the science when it comes to genetic epidemiology is to look at hundreds of thousands of, of subjects. And I think, you know, probably next year we will see the first genetic studies that have included over one million people. So, um, the mega stroke study is an international consortium with, uh, you know, 29 studies included, including the Earth and Stroke funded Enter Stroke study that has been done here at McMaster. And we had 68,000 uh, stroke cases and almost half a million controls. And uh, we also made a point of making sure there was ethnic diversity in as much as possible in our genetic study. And essentially, you know, this is, you know, what we have found. And, you know, we identify, you know, 32 uh, genes, uh, you know, that were associated with stroke. And uh, what you can see on the figure on the right side is, you know, what we call a Manhattan plot. And on the x-axis is the position in the genome of each of these variants. Each point is a single variant. And on the y-axis is the strength of association of these variants with stroke. So each time you see what, you know, a tower, uh, if I may, this is a sign of one association. And as you can see, they are all over the place. And uh, they associate with, you know, multiple, uh, you know, the types. And, you know, from this, um, I think, you know, this is all new. Oh, and it's actually impressed. Uh, but... Uh, as you can see, all these genes, you know, they, they will fall into different, you know, non-risk factors, uh, and that makes a whole lot of sense because we know these are important. But more importantly, as you can see, the majority of them, you know, are not associated with any non-risk factor. And I think, you know, this is perhaps the most exciting part of it is that now we've got this ability to identify genes, and the genes point us to, you know, potentially important mechanism that, you know, hopefully we can act on and perhaps develop new therapeutic interventions, you know, based on them.
Okay. And, you know, finally, uh, how can we use this, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, clinical application? Well, once we've found all of these variants together, we can combine them, combine the risk together to do uh, what we name polygenic risk score. And, and again, you know, this is, you know, all very new, but, you know, and, uh, you know, this, this recent study here, uh, what we can show is that by combining these variants together, uh, now, you know, we can get more predictive tools, uh, you know, to uh, identify people that could be at higher risk of stroke. And really, I think, you know, this is where in stroke, as well as in, you know, like coronary disease, this is where a lot of the genetics will head, is to, you know, use this polygenetic inheritance and, you know, with the tool of the GWAS to combine them, all of these variants together, and to try to improve scores such as the Framingham risk score, et cetera, uh, to better target individuals that are at high genetic risk. So just to, you know, summarize, and I think, you know, we've covered uh, a lot of ground, but, uh, you know, pharmacogenetics uh, as the promise to lead to better, safer drugs the first time and at the right dose. So this is, you know, the dream. But I think that, you know, one thing that, you know, we've learned uh, through all the studies that, you know, we've done is the importance for rigorous evidence-based approach. And I think, you know, often the danger is over-enthusiasm, uh, but we have to remind that, you know, the decision we make, you know, uh, you know, must lead to proven benefit, you know, to patients. And I think, you know, the, uh, the example with the, uh, you know, chronic lipidogrel therapy um, is a good example. Um, it's quite possible that CYP2C19 alleles, uh, you know, will have an impact in uh, acute coronary syndrome, but that doesn't mean that it applies to all clinical contexts, and, you know, we have to be uh, cognizant of this. On the other hand, you know, there's, you know, also promising leads, and, you know, as we've shown with, you know, the bigotron, and, you know, finally, I think what to our friend, you know, the, the lesson that I've taken from this is that, you know, very good clinical care, you know, without, you know, the need to go to the genetic lab is actually very good. And, and it's actually, you know, difficult to, uh, you know, to do better. And it's, you know, the importance of, um, of managing, you know, patients, you know, properly. On the other end, you know, I think that, you know, we're still in the early days of, you know, pharmacogenetics. And, you know, one thing is that pharmacogenetics has not yet, you know, gone to the polygenic model, uh, you know, type of, uh, you know, verage. And I think that uh, as, you know, we make more progress and understanding the genetic of stroke, and, you know, it's quite remarkable that in a single study we would be able to identify 32 genes associated with stroke, and I think this gives us a lot of hope that in the future, you know, we might be able to really predict, you know, the familiar risk of stroke and, uh, you know, perhaps to better understand uh, stroke itself, but also to predict we might be at higher risk and we might need earlier intervention to try to attenuate this risk. So uh, with this, I would like to... Uh, Thank you all for uh, your attention and uh, once again for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much. I, I guess we've moved beyond the earlobe crease, maybe, and uh, you know the risk of heart disease and that. I would like to thank, on, on behalf of the Stroke and Heart Foundation of Ontario, uh, Dr. Paré for uh, for um, giving this unbelievable where the future is going to be. Clearly, in uh, in um, in uh, research and therapeutics, and uh, astounding, just totally astounding. Thank you very much for getting us up to uh, the the future, Dr. Paré.